Welcome to the Unisoft question. I am Pulat Unisoft, your host. I interview lawyers and judges. The show is supported by my law practice, Unisoft Law Professional Corporation. I am a commercial litigator. I've done nothing but litigation since 2011. Many of you know me or my work. I would really appreciate your referrals. They are safe with me. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another very special judicial episode of the Unisoft question. My guest today is George Strathy, recently retired Chief Justice of Ontario. Hello, George. Hello there, Pulat. Thank you uh, for inviting me to join you today. I'm looking forward to the talk. It's my pleasure. And uh, to alleviate any concerns in the audience, I'm calling you George because that's the convention that we have. And uh, perhaps it wasn't quite conventional uh, a few decades ago for me to call uh, someone of your statue George, but today it's fine. And uh, it is fine. That is fine. I, in this respect, I want to tell you about the, the, the portrait gallery at the Court of Appeal. So I was there a few weeks ago, and uh, they, ha they have portraits of, 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 of the <clears throat> chiefs. And uh, at the time, uh, the current Chief Justice Talak wasn't yet appointed, and I don't think his portrait was up there yet. So your, your portrait was the last portrait. And as I looked at all of these portraits, you are the only one smiling <laughs> maybe somebody uh one of your predecessors showed a little bit of a hint of a smile on his face but you were the only one showing teeth is there a story there at all well there there is a bit of a story i suppose i i didn't find out until after the portrait portrait was up on the wall and hanging there that convention has it that people don't smile uh, for official portraits I didn't know that at the time, and I'm not sure it would have made any difference because um, I wanted to deliberately wanted to uh, present a welcoming exterior to the to the portrait and uh, to be seen to be you know, in a positive way uh, as a representative of the of the justice system through the portrait. The the law society is good enough to. Uh, to commission a portrait for every chief justice, both the, the trial court chief justice and the chief justice of Ontario. And um, I was essentially uh, told that I could, you know, subject to approval, I could choose the artist. And um, I, choosed, I chose an artist uh, whose work I actually owned or some of whose work I actually owned. His name is Momo Simic. And uh, Momo had a gallery in St. Jacobs, Ontario, and on a visit there, uh, my wife and I bought a, a beautiful portrait of a, a Mennonite um, cart being driven by two young women. So uh, the choice of the artist, and, and, and Momo is actually a very accomplished uh, portraitist as well as a, a, a general artist. So uh, I chose him to paint my portrait. I was very happy with the result, and um, there it is, my smiling face. Uh, on the walls of Osgood Hall until it's replaced by my successor, Chief Justice Tullock. Yes, and, and we'll look forward to that. I really hope to interview Chief Justice Tullock on the show uh, one day as well. You know, your smile on that portrait is a symbol of change to me that you brought to the Court of Appeal. And if anyone wants to read a summary uh, of the nature of that change or have a, a good idea of the nature of that change that you brought to the profession and to the Court of Appeal, they should read the article that you released last year. It's on the Court of Appeals website and it's called The Litigator and Mental Health. So here, I want to repeat for the audience, you have to read it. It's a stunning piece. It absolutely blows your mind. And it's not a one of those formalities that people who retire just publish so people can remember them longer. No, this is a really substantive essay that said things that I waited to hear for years and I thought they would never be said. And you said those things. So a lot of our conversation today 
will be based on this article. Again, it's called The Litigator and Mental Health. It's uh, just Google The Litigator and Mental Health Strathby, and it will come up. It's, it's a great piece. And uh, before we jump into that, and before we talk about the, the kind of change that you brought or the kind of change that was associated with your tenure, I want to talk a little bit about where you come from. And I ask everybody this question, where were you born? Well, I, it's pretty unconventional. I was born in Toronto. My parents were living in Toronto at the, at the time. I was uh, uh, born at Toronto General Hospital. Uh, where in fact my first, uh, uh, well, my first child was born in, in Women's College Hospital, my first daughter, but one of my, the next daughter was born at uh, Toronto General. So I was born and raised for the first few years of my life in Toronto where my parents were, were from. And what happened after the first few years of your life? Uh, well, we moved to Montreal. My dad was a banker. Uh -huh. And uh, he was uh, moved to Montreal, where we lived for about three years when I was between, I think, about six and nine or so. And then we spent uh, the next six years in the Bahamas, where uh, my dad was posted. So I, um, I spent uh, some of my early schooling and my early life in, in the Bahamas until when I was about 13, I was sent back to Canada for boarding school. So I... Uh, like I ended up in Canada again, and then in in uh, Montreal for university. You were exposed to quite a bit. You're almost almost an internationally trained lawyer, <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, not quite. Yes, you went to UFT uh, law. I know that you went to UFT law. You you are internationally trained in the sense that you went to secondary school in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. and uh, you were exposed to a d different country. Bahamas is a is different from Canada. I don't think it's anything like Canada. And uh, still, you returned. And uh, I know that you went to UFT law. But where did you do your undergraduate degree? I did an undergraduate degree in, in political science and economics at McGill. It was uh, then in, that, in those days, you could enter second year McGill from what was then grade 13 Ontario. So it seemed like a, uh, a good thing to get a jump on university. So I did an honors BA in international politics. I, I loved it. I was fascinated by it. I was thinking of uh, going into the, uh, the diplomatic service. I went to U of T did a master's degree at, at University of Toronto in political science, um, really soon found that, that the academic life was not for me. And uh, so I walked across the Queens Park Crescent to, uh, to the law school, applied to U of T Law School and uh, entered U of T Law School in 1971. UFT Law started in 1971. When were you called to the bar? 1976. So I articled, uh, I graduated from UFT Law in 74, articled for the next year, and, uh, and called to the bar in 1976. So you were a lawyer or a judge for more than 40 years then? Yeah, yeah. Surprising to think that now, but that, that's the case, I guess, uh, you know, 46, 46 years up until now, yeah. As I was reading uh, your article, uh, Litigator and Mental Health, I came across this paragraph. I apologize for reverting to the good old days because in many ways they were not so good. But when I started practice from about 1976 until email became common in the early 1990s, you could generally go home at night and not expect to receive phone calls or messages from work unless something was urgent, like the office was on fire or a client had a real emergency. The same was true on weekends. You could go home on Friday afternoon or evening and reasonably expect that no one would bother you, neither a lawyer nor a client, until Monday morning. And uh, another paragraph that uh, uh, is similar, talks about something similar. I articled in 1974 with the firm of McKinnon McTaggart, what would then be described as a medium-sized firm of about 25 lawyers with a strong litigation department. 
When I returned as an associate in 1976, the first thing I was told by one of the more senior partners was, plan your summer vacation now. We all take four weeks in the summer. The message was clear. You and your family are important to us and you need a good break. So is this serious? This, this Of course it's serious. Of course it's true. But it's, it's mind boggling right now. And uh, I understand uh, uh, your reservation when you talk about the good old days. There are a lot of things associated with the past that we now criticize, but there are a lot of good things associated with the past. And besides this, which is directly related to the topic of mental health, which is the topic of your article, I I, I know that you have a, this long span, This you have this long horizon, this long uh, term view of the legal profession and of the judiciary. You know how things have changed over decades. So this is one example of how things were good for at least for some lawyers uh, or, or, or for uh, some law firms. But can you talk about other things that we are forgetting now or forgot, but that were good? Maybe uh, something about practice, maybe something about habits, maybe something about uh, procedure uh, in court. Uh, what what have we lost? I, I, uh, I, maybe forever. Maybe we can get it back. Um, it's a big it's a big topic, uh, Pulat. But uh, I'll just mention, by the way, that the lawyer that uh, the partner who told me that I should plan my summer holidays was none other than Ian, Ian Binney, who was a partner at the firm, and he's actually written a recent article about that firm in the Advocates Journal. It talks about the culture in the firm and or a little bit about the culture. But but I think it was the, you know, the culture of the profession at the time was slower paced. And it was perhaps at least partly uh, because we didn't have the technology that we have today. You know, as I say in the article, you could you could uh, you usually communicate it with the client by letter. You could set out your opinion in a letter. And maybe a week later, you'd heal back from the client or you'd write a letter to an opposing lawyer and a week would go by, they'd have time to think about their response. So it was a it was a, a slower pace and I think necessarily less pressured pace than the practice of litigation today. Um, one of the things that I will say, and I think I've said it in other contexts, I worry about what the billable rate or the billable hour, the emphasis on billable hours is doing to the profession today. Uh, you know, creating a strong incentive to people to to work excessive hours because their remuneration is directly tied to it. That's that's one of the things that that concerns me about the state of the profession today. But and to go back to the what really your question was, Bulat, I think one of the things that I think is being is in danger at the moment is mentoring. Um, when I talk to young lawyers, as I often did in my capacity as chief justice, and even to, to senior lawyers, everyone was lamenting the decline in mentoring. And not it was the, that was the case before the pandemic came along. There would be a uh, reduced opportunities, re reduced. Uh, ethic that was that that regarded mentoring as a responsibility of a lawyer but i think the pandemic has made it even worse uh with the tendency to go from one zoom call to the next zoom call to the next zoom meeting uh to the next zoom uh hearing not a lot of time in between for the casual meetings between a lawyer and a junior lawyer or a lawyer and an articling student just to talk and to uh, to learn by by watching, to learn by osmosis. I mean, when I, and I don't think I was unique at all, uh, many lawyers who joined the profession in the 1970s and before learned from just sitting in another lawyer's office and listening to her or him communicate with, with clients, interview witnesses, talk to other lawyers, and and we were taken along, you know. I, I time and again, as a young lawyer, I a more senior lawyer would pass me in the hall and say, "Look, I'm going to such and such. 
you want to come along. It might be a, you know, a lawyer's organization dinner. It might be a, a lunch with another lawyer. It might be a court hearing, but, but it was just done because it was what lawyers did. We, we, we trained the next generation of lawyers by, by making them a part of the, the work without really worrying about whether you can bill the client for it or, or whether you'd recover the time. It was just, it was just the way, uh, the way the profession worked. And I, I do, I feel very strongly that 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 is um, is not happening as much as it should be, and uh, it particularly, it's not happening where lawyers are going into the practice without any experience at all uh, of working at a firm or working in a, even a small partnership. So that that troubles me the the uh, the the loss of of mentoring and mentoring opportunities. You know, I. I know a lot of people in this profession. I'm, uh, I have a lot of friends and I, I have a pretty broad view thanks to uh, connections, social media uh, and other things, uh, uh, files, opposing counsel also. And uh, I, I think it's a little bit also of a question of the quality of law firms. So uh, I see the best law firms constantly uplift their associates and partners everywhere. They talk about their associates and partners. They promote their associates and partners. And they give their associates, associates and partners a lot of training, a lot of uh, trial um, time and things like that. And I don't really see a lot of that from other firms. But the thing that bothers me is that we have, a, have had a paradigm shift. The traditional law firm model is receding in my view and we now have an army of law school graduates starting their own practices they don't have law firms and i remember when i did the same thing 12 years ago i did it because it was easy it's it's like in that book uh in that popular book a uh, very popular book right now atomic habits if something is easy it's it's people will tend to make it their habit. So it was really easy for me to start a law practice. And I started it. Technology made it very easy. Uh, regulations made it very easy. But now I was really one of the few 12 years ago. People were very surprised. But now we have an army of law school graduates doing the same thing. What, what are they to do? Uh, they don't have law firms. They don't have the traditional structures and relationships. Well, it's a it's a challenge. I, I think you know the the some of the the law schools are Lakehead and Toronto Metropolitan University or Lincoln Alexander, to be specific, are incorporating practice management, practice how to run a practice into their curriculum, and and that is is certainly going to be be a help. Um, but it I don't think it answers the the the, the concern that everybody. You can't just do it on your own. You need you need help. You need to have role models. You need to have examples of how lawyers behave and how they don't behave. And and uh, you have to learn skills that sometimes can only be taught by doing and practicing. And and you know, frankly, I'm not sure that I would agree with you, Pulat, that people are getting in court even at the big firms. One of the biggest complaints I've heard from lawyers, even at the big firms, is they're not getting into court as as juniors. Uh, they're not getting to ch stand on their own feet and do trials. Uh, in the back in the bad old days, uh, when I started out practice, I was doing trials in my first and second years of practice on my own. And um, now I think you could likely find mid-level partners at some big law firms in Toronto who've never done a trial on their own. And I think part of the problem is because they've never done a trial on their own, they're reluctant to to go to trial. They're nervous about going to trial. There's the system is designed to encourage and promote settlement and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I, I think uh, one of the consequences is that that junior mid-level lawyers are, are simply not getting into court and their advocacy skills are undeveloped their confidence in themselves is is undeveloped, and um, it's a it's a it's a bit unfortunate, frankly. 
Would you say that judges 30 years ago, it was less common for them to be frustrated with uh, counsel in the courtroom than now? Because, you know, every lawyer has their own story about judges being upset with a lawyer or frustrated to speak mildly. But do you think it was less common 30 years ago? I, I'm, it's hard to compare it. I mean, frankly, uh, back in the bad old days, there were some pretty grumpy judges around, grumpy even with uh, people who were, were doing a good job and who were experienced advocates. I think... Um, what I, I think may you can probably say that judges are more even tempered nowadays, but but I do know, and I know this just from talking to my colleagues on both the trial court and the court of appeal, that we would see a lot of people uh, come before the court and you'd say to yourself or your colleagues, you know, that young person has potential, but they need some mentoring. Um, and I don't want to put down um, newer advocates because some of the best advocacy we've seen in the Court of Appeal is from younger advocates. I'd say on the criminal side in particular, where advocates are regularly in the Court of Appeal, they, there are some very strong advocates at the or in the early years of the profession. But but we also see uh, some some advocates who who have um, show promise, but but need more experience and need more more guidance. We will certainly return to the topic of mental health, but having you on the other end of the screen, I can't help talking about appellate advocacy. You were a judge on the Court of Appeal for how many years? Eight, I think, or nine? A bit, a bit more than eight, but close to nine. Close to nine, right. So, and you you heard all kinds of appeals. I, I spoke with Associate Chief uh, in the previous episode, and uh, she said that uh, your court is um, a universal court. So you, you get to hear all kinds of appeals. You don't really specialize. And I think what I heard now is that criminal lawyers generally are better appellate litigators than civil lawyers. Is it true? I, I, I don't want to put it that way. I mean, I think what I was really saying is that there is an appellate bar in the criminal on the criminal side. People who specialize in appellate advocacy and, and both on the Crown side and the defense side uh, in, in criminal law, they are regular, uh, make regular appearances in the Court of Appeal. So they become, they become used to it. They become comfortable at it. And, um, and they're very, very effective at it. Uh, I that there is not that there are some civil lawyers who who specialize in in appellate advocacy, but I I would say they were fewer. The ones who do are extremely extremely good. Uh, but it you know it takes time to get used to uh, the the art of advocating in an appellate court. I don't like to call it an art actually because it that implies it's something you either have or you don't. I think it can be learned. Um, but um, but but no, I wouldn't want to. I don't say that there aren't some great civil appellate lawyers because there are. Trial judges try to find the justice of the case. They listen to evidence. They uh, look at the facts. They apply the law. So lawyers who regularly uh, are in trial courts they have a certain tunnel vision of what judges do. And I think most lawyers are, do not go to the Court of Appeal. Can you talk a little bit about what the Court of Appeal does? We know that it uh, um, uh, decides or determines questions of law a lot more than questions of fact. Uh, and uh, is it fair to say that the Court of Appeal essentially supervises uh, superior court judges when it comes to uh, applying the law or uh, stating the law. Can you talk more about the role of the Court of Appeal in this respect? I think you can look at it from, from two perspectives. Um, part of the, of the work of the Court of Appeal is what we re refer to as error correction, error correction. Uh, the argument comes before the court that 
the the trial judge uh, I misapplied the law, didn't didn't properly uh, state the law, or or in another example in the criminal side failed to instruct the, the jury properly, and so we are we are asked to correct that or error and uh, determine what the outcome should have been or would have been had the judge properly applied the law or properly stated the law and that's that is probably the the majority or a certain majority of the court's work appellate work the other the other part of the court's job is to uh, state the law determine the law declare the law develop the law um in and um in a way that maybe sometimes either reconciles or apparently conflicting superior court decisions or corrects one line of authority and applies another line or states the law according to what that other line uh, has, has said about it. So um, we, are, we are stating the law for the province to be applied by trial court judges in the province and uh, we we our aim obviously is to is to state it in in a clear way that will be understood and applied by by trial judges. I would say, in the in the majority of cases where we do that, we are we are moving the law incrementally, in in small steps as opposed to moving it in large steps because we we don't want to. Um, sometimes it's difficult to under, appreciate the consequences uh, of your decision if you state the law too too broadly. So we tend to do it in a more refined and contained manner. So this principle of containment, this principle of holding yourself back and or maybe even uh, the principle of minimalism, judicial minimalism, is it does it come from our tradition? Is it uh, uh, a more modern uh, phenomenon? What are the origins of this idea? It's not written down anywhere, maybe other in, except for pronouncements in appellate decisions uh, over the years or, or over the decades. What is the origin of this principle? And do you think this principle will always exist in, in this form that it exists in now? Well, I think it, it does come from our common common law tradition um, and it comes from the the way the common law has developed through the application of principles on a case-by-case -case basis and I would also say though that it's a it's in a certain sense a judicial philosophy of and what you might call judicial humility of of not wanting to do anything more than is necessary to decide the particular case in front of you um, and and as I say, the reasons are that you one very good reason is you can't always anticipate what what new facts might come before a court in the future or what arguments might be made to a court in a, the future that don't present them in the case in front of you. So I, I think you know most judges would prefer to take the cautious route. And to say, at least at the appellate level and the intermediate appellate level in the case of a court of appeal, um, and say, let's not go any farther than we have to. Would you agree that this principle is uh, works better or more commonly in... Uh matters not involving human rights or not involved in not involving civil liberties for example that this principle works better in commercial matters in uh, in civil matters and so on because when i can't help thinking of some dramatic reform introduced by appellate co courts in the past when uh, they authorized um, uh, uh, a huge dramatic transfer transformation of the concept of marriage for example right yeah. or or other similar uh reform can you speak to that a little yeah i i you're i'm not sure whether i would entirely endorse your your observation that you know that human rights um the principles wouldn't apply in the human rights field but but I do agree that there there are times, and and the uh, 
you know, the, the gay marriage decision of our court uh, is a good example of it, um, where a big a major step is necessary um, in order to, to bring the law in, in, in pace or in, in, in conformity with, with modern conceptions and modern attitudes. Um, but but I'm not even sure that in other areas of human rights that uh, it's 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 a I think it is appropriate in other areas of human rights to apply an incrementalist approach as opposed to a a big step radical change approach. Speaking of uh, judicial advocacy, yeah, I uh, can't help asking you about the contrast between excellent advocates and not so excellent advocates and this is a reality of, of law practice this is a reality of advocacy and i want to ask you about this so i will go back to your article this is the scripture for this interview today i, I again i can't emphasize this enough everyone should read this article uh, i i quote from your article litigation is stressful because the financial and personal stakes for the parties are high and the outcome is generally uncertain. The outcome depends a lot on the performance of counsel in a high-performance win-lose zero-sum environment. And you put performance in quotations uh, in your article. First of all, I want to ask you, why did you put the word performance in quotation marks in your article? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not sure, except just to maybe focus on it a little bit that that but I don't think there was any other particular reason so uh, it's 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 important this focus is important because you said here that judicial decisions depend on the quality of lawyers and uh, I want to dig into this a little bit and uh, of course this is important because um, whether you say it or not Every lawyer knows that they want to be a. Most lawyers want to be better lawyers, and uh, they want to be better lawyers probably because they think they will get better outcomes. And I'm talking about litigators, only litigators right now. Uh, with all uh, due apologies to solicitors, this interview is about litigators. So, let's say two lawyers come to you uh, to the court of appeal. You're on the panel, and uh, one lawyer is a star. Uh, her performance or his performance is magnificent. The advocacy is superb. And the other lawyer is not really experienced, uh, maybe didn't prepare well, maybe uh, slacked off, or maybe just doesn't know what he's doing because he just graduated from law school and nobody can stop him from coming to the court of appeal. So what is the effect on justice what is the effect of the situation on 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 justice on justice of the case? Um... Well, look, um, all judges, appellate judges and trial judges, want to get it right. You know, they want to decide the case in the manner that's that's fair and just and legally correct. Uh, the advocate advocacy system, adversarial system supposes that you put two protagonists uh, in a courtroom and in that crucible will come the facts and the law and the context that will enable the court to decide the case in a just and, and correct manner. <clears throat> when, when only one of those participants uh, is, is effective in doing that, uh, it makes it difficult for the for the court to be satisfied that they've got everything they need in order to decide the case, and and um, and it very often means that the court has to step in to make sure there's been a fair balance in the presentation of the case. Whether I mean judges don't mind doing more work, but that's what it basically means is that you have to you can't rely on counsel to put everything you need to have in front of you. You have to go out and make sure that you've righted, righted the, the playing field and that you have uh, everything you want to decide the case. So, um, and you know, there's, there's, I can think of many times, both as a trial judge 
and as an appellate judge, where I would say to myself, you know, I wish I'd got uh, a full argument or a, 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 an effective argument on the other side of the case, because it leaves me perhaps with a with a view of the case that isn't uh, what it should be. And, um, you know, I, I just want to emphasize something, though, Pulat, and that is, you know, I firmly believe that that advocacy is a skill that can be learned. Um, we've created this notion that someone's a gifted advocate as though they were, you know, handed a gift and told, okay, you, you can do it. Uh, but in fact, I think it, it's like any other skill. It takes observation, study, practice, experience in order to develop it. And I think, I think if somebody wants to be a good advocate, then they have to apply themselves to learning that particular trade and learning skill and learning how to, how to, how to do it. One of the great schools for new articles, I'm sorry, for new lawyers, for new or junior litigators is the small claims court or the simplified procedure. So anywhere where yeah. legislatures can simplify procedure, that forum tends to become a great training ground for new advocates. Do you think it will help if something like that happens at the court of appeal level? I'm not saying have a small claims court of appeal. Well, we have divisional court, but it's not really simplified. But do you think something like that will help? Where I remember when I just started out, I also did trials in my first years, but I did trials in the small claims court. And that was great school. And I loved it. And because the stakes are low, the procedure is fantastic. You, as long as you file it, it's admissible. And then everything goes to wait. Right. So uh, can we do something like that uh, at the appellate level? What do you think? So it's already there. I, um, mm -hmm. I've said many, many times that the Court of Appeal for Ontario is the best advocacy school in the country. Uh, and I encourage uh, newer lawyers to come in and simply watch us for a day, mm -hmm. watch good advocacy for a day. Uh, watch a criminal appeal or a civil appeal. Uh, call up the registrar and find find out or look on our list and see what's coming up uh, in in the week ahead. Um, you know, when I was a, a younger lawyer, and I know many many did the same. I'd wander into the court of appeal, Osgood Hall, and sit in a courtroom and just watch for a while. And uh, so that's number one. Number two, um, as you may know, on our last year, I think, or the year before. Associate Chief Justice Fairburn and I announced, released a statement encouraging counsel to give newer members of the bar an opportunity to stand on their feet and argue a point. And again, that was a tradition of the bar for, for as long as I was practicing law and the court understood it. You know, if, if, the, uh, if senior counsel said, my, my colleague, Ms. So-and-so is going to argue the third point, we knew that that lawyer was being given an opportunity to to stand up uh, for, sometimes for their first time to make a point and we would do what we could to uh, to give them a good opportunity to uh, to do that so i think it's happening and uh, i hope it will continue to happen i think part of the problem again is that um you know some some um, some middle level lawyers have never appeared in the court of appeal so they're not likely to hand the argument over to a, a brand new lawyer when they get a chance to do it but it, we did see it being being done you know we did see uh counsel giving a piece of the argument to their junior and it, it i think our statement uh gave the lawyers something to say when the client said well why is why is she standing up to argue this point why aren't you senior counsel could say well the court of appeal has told us that they'd like to see it happen. So it's a good idea. The concept of learning by watching is so old and is so proven and it's so common in every other field. Uh, I'm just shocked that law schools spend so much time on moots. And I don't remember one time when we were told to go and uh, watch actual proceedings. Can the Court of Appeal call law schools and just 
ask them i don't know do you have any does the court of appeal have any relationships with law schools can the court of appeal or other courts influence our law schools and uh help uh introduce this to law schools moot courts are great but they are in my respectful uh opinion are becoming more and more of a sort of an elite uh path for a very small group of law students to become distinguished enough for on-campus interviews we're talking about training the army of law school graduates who are going to come to these courts tomorrow without mentoring without law firms behind them without anything like that can law schools send them uh with the, a court of appeals permission of course to observe the proceedings it's so obvious and so simple or maybe it's it's been done i don't know well in my in my capacity as chief justice i regarded myself to some extent as an ambassador of the court of appeal and uh or at least that was one of the hats i wore and every time i visited a law school and i think i visited every law school in ontario uh, I would say to groups of students I spoke to, come to the Court of Appeal. You'll be welcome there. You don't even need to ask our permission. You walk in as a public courtroom. You walk in, plunk yourself down, and uh, and and see what it's what it's like. Um, you know, I don't. I won't get into the debate with you about the value of of mooting, uh, but I do know there's a lot of it going on, and we're constantly uh, being asked to to uh, provide a panel for one mood or, or another. But but I, I agree with your point about watching. Um, and watching it in person is not the same as watching it on Zoom. Um, so I hope, I hope people do it more. Yes, absolutely. And perhaps law firms can open their doors not only to their own associates and students, but maybe even other uh, students and and uh, and the uh, junior lawyers as part of the pro bono initiatives i don't know of course it's not pro bono because they're not clients but as part of the uh, professional duty to mentor the next generation of of lawyers and students because we don't have enough law firms for every lawyer in the province no uh, this is this is this little point that i wanted to make i wanted to thank you for something so as i was reading this article I came across words that I thought I would never see. You know, uh, we, as a society, we have identified several disadvantaged groups that uh, require particular attention, that require a particular support. And uh, we often see these lists. There's a list on the Human Rights Code, uh, and um, we see these lists in many other places. So in your article, you also have your own lists when you talk about feelings of isolation, uncertainty, and stress. And then you list the groups that require our particular support, uh, stress experienced by Black, Indigenous, racialized, LGBTQ2S council, women, and then uh, you say internationally trained lawyers, and then you say those with different accents. And this I thought I would never see on any list, and I'm so thankful to you personally, because of course I have one of those different accents uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody noticed and uh, i really appreciate it because as an advocate when i come to the courtroom at least in the beginning of my career i was conscious of that because i personally know that we are an audible profession that's why we call hearings hearings because judges listen and then what the, of course they judge uh or they will they will hear my, the, the the advocate's voice and our judges are, are wonderful are excellent and they will overcome any bias but uh still accents they can be strong they can be weak but they can tend to create accents uh biases so i really want to thank you for including those with different accents on this list because especially in the big city like toronto this is a huge group of advocates and they are quite self-conscious some of them are quite self-conscious like i was in the beginning of my career so as we approach the conclusion of our conversation do you want to say something to all of these especially junior lawyers who are every day very similar to that story that you wrote about of this very senior partner who was trembling but if if the senior partner is trembling, they are trembling every day a lot more. 
and they are trembling not because uh, that this profession is, is difficult or that the subject matter is, diff is difficult, but also because they're members of these groups maybe that you listed or because they don't have the opportunities for mentoring. Can you uh, uh, say something to them to put their minds at ease a little bit? Hearing from you will be particularly important for those people. Well, I, I would say two things, uh, uh, Pula. One is, um, and as I've tried to emphasize uh, in our discussion, advocacy can be learned. You know, it, it didn't, people didn't become good advocates because somebody waved a wand over their head and said, all right, you're the good advocate. Uh, everybody can learn it. Uh, there are techniques of learning it. Um, there are practice uh, doing it. Critique being critiqued by others. Uh, and, and studying and reading and learning methodology. So it's not insurmountable doesn't happen immediately, but if, if one wants to be a good advocate, a good barrister, uh, it, it can be learned. And that is the number one thing I'd say. Number two, and again, I've said this to lawyers many, many times over the last number of years, you know, take care of yourself. Just, and it it's comes back to the mental health side issue, and that is, um, you have to um, look after number one sometimes. And, and that, it's, it's not e always easy. It's not some, some factors that are outside your control, particularly in the early years of practice where it's a challenging environment for, for everyone. But, and it, I don't mean to lay, lay this on the individual because you know, mental illness is a very complex matter and in many cases well it is uh, simply an illness and you can't necessarily make it right by putting your saying i'm going to get uh i'm going to be be well it just doesn't work that way but i think one can attempt to put boundaries around oneself in order to find some time for oneself and one's family, um, and one can develop habits that that blunt the impact of some of the challenges that face us in the in the profession. And also, I've emphasized as well that there there is assistance out there. We're not alone. Uh, the, the, there are programs uh, to provide support, but it's a it's a Mental health is a serious issue in our profession, and I've been attempting in my discussions of this subject to to ensure that we do take it seriously and we do take steps to reduce the impact of some of our our behavior and some of our practices on uh, on all lawyers, but particularly uh, lawyers affected by mental illness or affected by other uh, challenges in their lives and their careers. I know that you're retired. I know that uh, you're not a judge anymore, but I also know that you will not stop working with this profession and helping this profession and helping our communities. And uh, this gives me so much hope and this gives me so much joy to know that we're not losing you, that you're still here and uh, of course, I want to thank you for the decades of service, your this huge amount of work, and you did a, made a huge contribution to Ontario, to Canada, to the legal profession here. But I also want you to stay and uh, to be with us, not to leave us, the lawyers, alone, not to leave the profession uh, alone and uh, to con continue contributing. I'm so thankful to you. And I'm also thankful to you for this interview. Thanks so much, Pulat. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you very much. And I will be around for a while. So thank you. This is great news.